Good evening. First, I would like first I would like to thank God for allowing me to speak before you this evening. I want to thank my sister Tamika, my brother Johnny, my mother Doris, who I'm sure is in attendance, for supporting me during this journey. I would like to thank my friends, the members of our organization that still remains nameless, and the community for backing every one of my initiatives. Lastly, I would like to thank Reverend Lightfoot, Reverend Whitaker, and Angel Visit Baptist Church for extending this invitation to me. I'm honored to speak during this beautiful event. I do not know how many are in attendance this evening, but for those of you who do not know me, my name is Reginald Carter. I've lived in Tappahannock all of my life before attending Virginia State University for college. Before college, I played on numerous sports teams, including the football team, the basketball team, as well as I ran on the track and field team. As with many others, I was called to action after witnessing the modern day lynching of Mr. George Floyd. After seeing such a heinous act occur, I realized that I could no longer sit idly by and do nothing, so I took action. I assisted with organizing a rally and protest that occurred on June 10th, 2020. The events that day led me to executive produce a short documentary title entitled March on Tappahannock. I've worked with Dream for Purpose Marketing Agency to display their Black is Beautiful art installation in Tappahannock for two months with an emphasis on having it displayed on election day. I have engaged in several conversations with the Essex County Board of Supervisors calling for the removal of the Essex County Confederate Monument. In response to those conversations, I started a GoFundMe that has raised over $7,000 of my $10,000 goal, all of which will be donated towards the county's removal resolution. Currently, I'm working on getting a historical highway marker placed in Essex County that acknowledges Mr. Thomas Washington, the victim of the only documented lynching in Essex County. I've also received sponsorship to, decide to design my own Virginia license plate, which will pay homage to one of the oldest Black-owned newspapers in Virginia, the Richmond Planet. I currently reside in Richmond, Virginia, where I work in human resources for, the, for a state agency. I have been asked to speak today on Dr. Martin Luther King Jr.'s life and legacy, amongst other things. When I reflect on the life and legacy of Dr. King and what resonates most closely with me, I think of his letter from a Birmingham jail. In that letter, Dr. King makes a profound statement that is true today as it was then. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Whatever affects one directly affects us all indirectly. If I'm honest, there is nothing that I can say to do Dr. King's legacy justice. With that being said, I can only share my remarks and hope to replicate the spirit of Dr. King and not an imitation of him. If I can accomplish this, then I've done my job here today. So let me start by saying, Dr. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, John Lewis, Rosa Parks, Harriet Tubman, and Maggie Walker, we're all ordinary people like you and me. Let that resonate for a second. Dr. Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, John Lewis, Rosa Parks, Harriet Tubman, and Maggie Walker were all ordinary people like you and me. They were ordinary people who did extraordinary things. Their legacies are the epitome of their preparation coming to fruition. The next part is for my young people in the audience. When I say there are ordinary people like you and me, I mean that so often when we think of Dr. King and other pillars of the black community, we think of them in stone and statue. We think of their powerful words and influence. We think of their accomplishments and ingenuity. However, they are just men and women. And all of these people are ordinary people, just like you and me. They went beyond what anyone thought they could do. These individuals have provided us with the blueprint that what people with goodwill, courage, and determination can achieve, that blueprint has shown us that we can change the world. No longer can we as black people maintain the status quo of this is how things, this is how things have always been and this is how things are always going to be. If that were true, we would have never been granted the right to vote. Barack Obama would have never been elected the first African-American president of the United States. Kamala Harris would not be getting sworn in as the first African-American woman vice president in two days. And Raphael Warnock would not have been elected as the first black governor in Georgia. No more will we allow anyone to dictate what we are capable of based on the color of our skin. 
it is paramount that we understand where we have came from in order to see where we can go. To that, you must venture beyond the walls of the traditional classroom and seek out all that there is to know about our people and our history, because black history is American history, not the whitewash history that the majority teaches us in an attempt to keep us oppressed. I encourage every one of you to do your independent research to understand our history. In preparation to speak to you all today, I watched the film Selma, I watched One Night in Miami, and I watched American Skin. I went on this journey to try and figure out how to best approach discussing Dr. King's legacy. It was in my preparation that I actually recalled a time just days before my college graduation. I had an opportunity to visit the Holly Knoll in Gloucester, Virginia. For those of you who do not know, the Holly Knoll was a part of the Gloucester Institute, and it was considered the intellectual and cultural hub for prominent African Americans. The Holly Knoll provided African Americans a venue to engage in debates surrounding issues central to the black community. It is also widely believed that under the property's 400-year-old live oak tree, Dr. King wrote portions of his famous I Have a Dream speech on a bench overlooking the York River. I actually sat on that very bench that is believed that Dr. King sat on, and I remember reflecting on Dr. King's legacy. I remember wondering, how was Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. the man and not the myth? What did it feel like to lead a movement that would change the world? Did Dr. King even know that he was making history? How did this man of great renown juggle being a leader, a husband, and a father? I remember thinking what I wouldn't give to learn this information, because as you know, they don't teach this in our history books. After my own call to action, I now feel that I have a better understanding of what it must have felt like to be Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. That is what I will share with you today. In the year 2021, we're still fighting for the same thing that Dr. King was fighting for during the civil rights era. We as black people are still fighting for equality. Nonetheless, what equality looks like looked like in the 60s is much different than what equality looks like now. However, many of the ob obstacles still remain. The KKK still exists. Instead of them hiding behind their hooded masks to protect their identity, they now hide behind their closed session meetings, their Make America Great Again political affiliation, their Proud Boys affiliation, their charitable contributions, and their private Facebook groups. Has anyone heard of the Essex, Virginia mil uh, militia group or the What's Going On in Tappahannock group? If so, then you know exactly what I'm talking about. I know what it felt like for Dr. King to meet in secrecy to strategize his efforts. Just as he met in secrecy in the 60s, we meet in secrecies in the Black Leaders Achieving Community Change Facebook group. We meet there to ensure a particular group of individuals do not learn of our plans and thwart our efforts. Unlike the civil rights era, leaked information may not result in death, but now it may result in a canceled event. I know what it's like to lead a march that the vast majority did not want. I know what it feels like to wonder if the community will show up to support you. I know what it feels like to wonder if you'll be met with violence and aggression or if you'll be met with peace and love. Like Dr. King, I know what it feels like to experience struggle within the movement itself. He experienced struggle from factions that thought that he was either too accommodating or the nonviolent protest movement was weak and soft. My struggle is that I no longer currently reside in Essex County, and not everyone agrees with my particular strategy to get real change in the community. I know what it feels like to be threatened by the local militia in an attempt to invoke fear, because I protest on June 10th, 2020, the local militia began to spread rumors that we had plans to block off the Downing Bridge and that they would be armed and ready in the event that the sheriff's office needed their assistance. I know what it's like to feel at a moment's notice to potentially have a peaceful demonstration turn violent because of an unlawful police interference. On that same day of June 10th, 2020, because we did not fully comply with one of the stipulations put in place, police were on standby to force us back to the space that they had given us to protest. I do not know what it feels like to have bricks thrown through my window or have my property set ablaze. However, I know what it feels like to have the superintendent contact my place of employment to threaten legal action against me. Just like, like, just like Dr. King, I also know what it feels like to have propaganda spread about my family and myself in an attempt to defame my character. 
I also know what it feels like to have my credibility questioned by a member of the community. All of these examples are tactics used as a deterrent to stop my process, my progress, excuse me. But just like Dr. King, I will not be deterred. Dr. King's movement as a whole happened on the backs of a group of men and women, not a single man. He made history and progress through collective activity with the Southern Christian Leadership Conference, not by one person saying or doing a few things and then the world all of a sudden became a better place. We must be proactive and build a diverse coalition. As black people, we are very adept at being reactive. We will respond to the wrongful killings of our black brothers and sisters. We will respond to the unjust actions taken against our community. However, what we lack is sustainable organization. If you need an example of the opposition's successful organization, look no further than the Capitol riots on January 6, 2021. We must do better at being proactive if we genuinely want everlasting, if we genuinely want an everlasting movement and not a brief moment. The first step is working collaboratively with our elders. Again, we cannot know where we are going as a people unless we have known where we have been. Our elders are aware of our history and it is embodied within them. They know what has worked in the past and they also know what has not. To my elders, we love you and we appreciate your wisdom. Now is the time for you to have faith that we as the youth can continue this movement for equality. You have to trust that we can continue marching, protesting and seeking change in your absence. In order to have faith in us, you must understand that we are not you. We will not make the same mistakes that you have made because you will be here guiding us forward. Have you taken the time to ask us what it is that we actually want? Because the majority seems to think that they know what we want. So let me clarify. As a 31 year old millennial, I am old enough to have an intellectual conversation with my elders, but I'm also young enough to have the respect of Gen Z. The actions and events being led by the youth are not always necessarily attached to a larger organization like the NAACP or Black Lives Matter. While many participants may outspokenly support these organizations, it does not mean that they are representative of them. For too long, we have prayed and awaited the support of another organization to assist our cause. This insistence upon waiting recalls another Dr. King quote, from a letter from Birmingham jail. For years now, I've heard the word wait. It rings in the ear of every Negro with piercing familiarity. This wait has almost always meant never. We must come to see with one of our distinguished jurists that justice too long delayed is justice denied. Now is a time for action and the ability to help ourselves. We have to have faith that God will put us in a situation that we, that God will not put us in a situation that we cannot handle. When we say black lives matter, we know that all lives matter. We understand that all of God's creations matter. What we mean is black lives matter too because society seems to have forgotten that fact. When we call for the removal of all racist Jim Crow Confederate monuments, we know that removing a monument does not fix a racist system. However, we are asking for equality. You can only obtain equality through addition or subtraction. We know that the majority will not build us black monuments or black statues. So we're asking for the removal of the Confederate ones respectfully. Removing the statues removes the symbol of their racist ideology. When you remove the, sim the symbol, you remove the power. Once their symbols are gone, the real work begins in fixing a system that was not intended to support black people and making a new one that will. Lastly, I will leave you with my thoughts on privilege. Recently, I had a conversation with someone who said they understand that they have privilege and it infuriates them to use it. Just as I relate to this individual, I will share with you today. The ability to decide whether or not to use your privilege is a privilege within itself. Most of us will move on from this earth never having had any privilege to use. To those of you who have privilege and wish to be on the right side of history, we need you. 
You are important to building our diverse coalition moving forward. You are important to us in building a sustainable organization. But you must decide how to use your privilege for the greater good of the movement. I cannot do that for you. In closing, to the individuals who question why are we protesting here in Essex County? Why are we calling for the removal of the Confeder Confederate monument? Why we are calling for the name change of the Essex Intermediate School? And why we are calling for the removal of Confederate pictures in the circuit court? Let this serve as a notice. The answer then and always will be the aforementioned direct quote from Dr. King himself. Injustice anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Whatever affects one directly affects us all indirectly. I'd like to leave you with the ideology of the new movement from the words of the late John Lewis. Do not get lost in the sea of despair. Be hopeful, be optimistic. Our struggle is not the struggle of a day, a week, a month, or a year. It is the struggle of a lifetime. Never ever be afraid to make some noise and get in good trouble, necessary trouble. Change does not end here, it starts here. Thank you and God bless. Amen. Wow. Beautiful. Wow. Praise God for your words. Praise God for your passion, your convictions as you continue uh, to seek equality. And I thank you for your, your work, your commitment to this community. I think you're a man on the move for sure. We will keep our eyes and our ears open as we seek to continue to support the efforts to help to keep the dream realized. So we thank you for your words tonight, and we look forward to hearing more from you as we continue to march toward okay, justice. Okay, Reggie. Thank you, Mr. Carter. Okay. Thank you so very much. That really touched me. Amen. Yes.